I love writers. I love all kinds of writers. I especially love young adult writers because I think they're some of the most amazing uh, writers on the planet. And um, I like reading. And there's a new book out. It's actually the debut novel. It's called Shallow Waters. And let me welcome the author, Anita Kopach. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so honored. I love that. Well, Hottest listen. show on the planet the galaxy it is it and it is because of the people so like it's not me bragging it's more me saying i have some of the best folk on and so i dare anyone to challenge that um so so i finished reading you know children of blood, blood and bones uh gilded ones and now i'm seeing your book and i'm like okay all right uh it's it's set in africa it's it's about a, a yoruba legend yemaya which i've been talking about with dr carr in class a black mermaid deity. I just finished reading, well, I read it last year, um, you know, Ta-Nehisi Coates' book, Shadow yeah. Dance. And, and so this is in that vein. All right. So what you know about Yemi Ya and why did she inspire this book? So I, I love Yemi Ya. I have been um, a follower of her, a follower of her since my teens. And when, when I was in my 20s around, one of my friends told me that um, she was said to watch over our ancestors when they came over on the Middle Passage. And when I was like, okay, wait, a black mermaid watched over us, right? Like or our, our ancestors, I do feel like it's us because our ancestors are within us but they, she watched over the ones that made it and the ones that decided to jump or were thrown overboard. So she watched over their souls. And I think that was what, that was the seed that went into my soul that, that started the story. Um, but, but I feel like that was probably the point where I was just like, all right, the original mermaid is black, just like the original woman is black, right? <laughs> and why do we not have any black mermaid stories out there? And when they were, you know, I know that, that Disney is making the little mermaid black, but that kind of put a fire under my ass to be like, yo, that was like me coloring like the books when I was younger, coloring the white princesses black. We have the original story. Let's share that. Oh. Thank you. Uh, and, you know, for some people, you know, they're really frustrated and angry that we are just now learning about these things. But we have to recognize that if we were taught this from day one, the, the bondage and the racism, racism makes no sense. You know, if the original woman, the original man, if math and science, if all of the things that we, you know, know it's genius, uh, Western civilization, civilization period. There's no Greek and Roman civilization without the, you know, the, the folk from Nubia, the folk from- well, the, the Greeks and the Romans, they went to Egypt to study for 30 years, you know, like they went in order to, to create these philosophies. So we know where they came from. Right, so, so why would they tell us that? Because well, it was you know. in in if we if we were practicing our African spirituality, we were murdered, like the ones that the in within the diaspora. So they tried really hard to erase that part of our spirituality, and they did a really good job because even me growing up in the church, we're taught that these you know it's demonized. African spirituality is demonized. Like we think that that you know, all of voodoo and voodoo and all of those things are, are straight up demonized. And so while we are not killed now, you know, the, we still have that in our system, the fear of being killed if we practice this. And so um, they, they've done a lot to try to keep it away from us, but that's one of the things to me if we connect to our spirituality, we are now, we, we connect to parts of us that have nothing to do with anyone trying to hold us down, right? Mm -hmm. Like we, we are, we have a straight up connection if we want it. I mean, you think about the lanes, not just death, but going to hell. So that whole mythology around us going to hell for practicing these things, the Haitians, uh, the folk in Espanola were like, mm, 
we're going to do this anyway, uh, and we're going to be free. So y'all go ahead with that. But, you know, it's interesting, Anita, Anita Kopach is here. And, you know, as you're sitting down to do this first novel to tackle this big topic, walk us through that process and how long did it take? Yes. So um, I'm going to tell you the whole thing, because from the beginning, from the first thought of that, you know, coming into my system to now, which is now the book is published, that was about seven years. And number of completion, those, number of completion. Yeah. Okay. Yes, right? That's right. <laughs> so two of those years, I did have writer's block. And what I realized was that um, earlier on, this one person gave me this advice. He was like, if you have writer's block, close your computer, do not try to write. Wait until your inspiration comes again, because it's just not going to be as dynamic if you try to write through it. And I was like, oh, really? Okay. And so I did. And it was two years, girl. <laughs> I was like, am I ever going to get inspiration again? And what I realized is that I had to grow into the person to understand Yemeya's next step, right? Like I had to grow into that person myself to even understand her emotional journey, what she's gone through. The whole thing was very, um, it was an emotional journey because I think it was the first time that I allowed myself to fully dive into what it might have felt like to be on the middle passage, to be in chattel slavery, um, like really, really, really dive into what, what we felt emotionally, physically, all of those things. And um, so I, I do say this sometimes because my kids will like come in and they'll see me like crying at the computer and they're like, are you okay, mom? And I'm like, oh, you know, just explaining to them what I'm writing, but yeah. Where, where did you get the story? I mean, you know, I, I remember reading Middle Passage, um, which is a novel, the classic novel, and the depiction of what was going on in that ship. And most of these ship stories actually are some of the best well-written stories of all time, you know, um, horrific. I remember reading the Amistad. I remember, you know, so like what, what, what did you draw upon to channel what it was like, you know, to be in the hold of a ship, uh, to, to, you know, be snatched from your home. She's 16, the main character, 16 year old. 17. Yeah, yeah. 17? Yep. 17. Okay. I'm sorry. And okay. so you know, walk us through where, where you found the inspiration for that. Story. Yeah. So for me, I, I definitely connected to my ancestors and I did, I did do research, but actually diving into the, you know, the emotion and all of that, I connected to my ancestors and, and to Yemeya. A lot of the time I felt like Yemeya was sitting at the edge of my bed telling me the story. There was no outline. I had no idea what was going to happen. I just kept writing. Like it felt like I'm just obeying, right? Like I'm like, yes, right? And like just writing. And um, I would say that, you know, I mean, even Amistad, like you said, like there, there are so many things that I have read and seen that, that um, I kind of brought all together into this one part of the book. And it was really interesting doing it from the perspective of a mermaid in the water. So she was seeing it, but not um, fully being in it, like seeing it from a perspective that I'd never, um, I've never seen it from. I love it. All right. So um, I want to say it's young, this is young adult, this is for young adults or is it not for young adults? It's, it's, it's for adults. But, um, and my, I know that my, my publishers are going to kill me every time because I did write it originally for young adults. I felt that. So I'm, I'm like, you know, and, and this, the genres and the, the, you know, I feel like it's so white. I'm going to say it out my mouth. Um, <laughs> the, the notion that art or literature or music has grades, like there's no grade level to words, you know, it's just where you are when you read it. Like I read some very adult things when I read Roots in the fifth grade, like the whole book. Yeah. I'm sure, you know, if I read it today, it would sit differently completely. I had to read Beloved three times before it clicked for me because I was too young and too yeah. immature to understand what Toni Morrison was doing. 
but those words, anybody can read them. Uh, yeah. That we put these things in, this is a black book and this is for young, you know, it's like, meh, you know. It is, it is. I feel the same way. And like, you know, when they were like, this has got to be an adult, adults, adults need to read this. And I was like, well, that's true. I would want to read it, right? And, and so what they said was, you know, all these adults are going to pass it down to their kids, right? Just so that it doesn't seem like adults won't read it. You know, okay, it's well, a YA. Listen, I was uh, at midnight in line every time Harry Potter came out, pushing them little kids with the little capes and their little w wizard wands out of the way so I could get my, my Harry Potter. And I wasn't the only adult in line, you know, because the truth of the matter is- I do, no. <laughs> And those of you who weren't in line, you were reading it too secretly and you were happy that you had a Kindle or a Nook to read it in so nobody knew you were reading Harry Potter. The truth of the matter is we read, readers read, period. Yeah. And, you know, it's time for us to break that chain as well because I think it really uh, limits, you know, because you're like, that's for kids. So some of my favorite books are for kids uh, yeah. because they're just really good and really well done. That's the sense that I got from yours. So, so there's that. Um, you know, you background growing up in the church, where are you from originally, Anita? I'm from, I'm from California originally. My parents, my mom is from St. Kitts. My dad is from Poland. And um, uh, our ancestors on my mom's side are from Nigeria and Ghana. And okay. so, um, but within um, St. Kitts and in California it was Methodist. Church. Okay. All right. And, and growing up with a white daddy, well, American white, because, you know, again, made up constructs and yeah. Poland has a black Madonna and a whole lot, a lot of other Thank things you. going on. You know, I'm it's glad you know that. Listen, when my <laughs> I love that, you know, that when my mom went there in the 60s, she was like people were staring at her, like just staring. And she's like, Maggie, did I did I start my period? Like, why is everyone staring at me? And he was like, oh. They've never seen a black woman in person. And she's like, what? And then she would go to the houses and there's black Mary and black Jesus in every Polish person's house, a black Mary and black Jesus. So it was, you know, I'm glad that you know that. <laughs> I think, you know, that's the most important thing that we know ourselves and that we know each other because that's where, you know, the fear erases, right? Because nobody's the boogeyman. We all, yeah, yeah. we all come with culture, stories, history, and everyone should want to know everyone else's culture and history. You know, I can yeah. tell you chapter and verse, everything about Judaism and the Holocaust, uh, because it's taught and it's, you know, we're, we're reminded every year and rightfully so. Um, and these things should be taught uh, in schools and people should be talking about the culture and the history of all people so that we can appreciate that we're a gorgeous mosaic. Agreed, agreed. <laughs> so um, growing up, uh, I guess what we would call biracial, you know, wh what was your Damascus moment? Because there had to be, you know, a moment where it was like, oh, you know, this black thing is, all right, let me, let me dive in. Well, yes, yes, exactly. I, I would say that I was raised as a black woman. Um, I think that both of my parents understood that in America that I feel like I would be considered, you know, a black woman wherever I'm going. No one's going to be like, oh, that's a white girl. Maybe they would, but I don't think I haven't. It hasn't happened. <laughs> but um, they, they both understood what it was like to be raised, you know, just in America, what it would be like. So, so I, I, we had black is beautiful pins all over the house. You know, my mom loves herself, right? Like she would just always be in the mirror, like, oh, she's also, you know, like Caribbean. I don't know if you know very many Caribbeans, but they, you know, they love themselves. <laughs> and so she taught us to love ourselves. And um, one of the things for me, I, I mean, my mom did tell me about slavery and all of these things before school. But when I was in school and they were taught, teaching about slavery, when they were teaching about civil rights, when they were teaching about black people not being human, I, there was this part of me that was just like, what? I, I thought we were magic, you know? Like it just was, it just felt like, it, like a deflation, like, oh, wow. And so, 
what I wanted to do with this book was teach a painful part of American history, but with a badass black female protagonist. So that when, because because we do need to learn about this type of this time in history. And I know there's a lot of time, a lot of places now that are not wanting to teach this time in history. And so I just feel like the timing is divine that this is coming out and we can learn about it, but from the, the uh, perspective of a really beautiful heroine. Yemi Ya, uh, shallow waters. Do, do you swim? I love to swim, yes. Okay, because you know, as a group of people, black people do not swim as much as we should. I'm, I took my lifeguard li license uh, about a couple of dozen years ago. And, um, you know, it was one of the best things that I ever did because now I can save people and myself. But, you know, water is natural, right? Yeah. For us. Um, yeah. But we have also, because of a lot of Jim Crow laws and, and black people being stoned in water and, you know, being run out, out of beaches and swimming pools and people draining pools when we get in it, we've had this aversion to water when that is a, so, so talk a little bit about our immersion through yeah, your yeah. character in yeah. this water. Absolutely. So I love that you said all that. Um, the, the beautiful woman who wrote my foreword, Dr. Love, she was actually just sharing that a lot of people in her generation um, were scared of water because of all the things that you said, but also because of our ancestors coming over on the Middle Passage and seeing people jump off or being thrown over, just having this horrific experience. So then they taught generation after generation to be scared of water. And so this reclamation, reclamation of water and loving water, because we are such a soulful people and water is so soulful. It, you know, you, you even think of the waters within us, our tears, our sweat, our blood, all of those things, it's all a part of water. And if we, if we reclaim that and reclaim the beauty in water, emotion, spirit, there's so many things that have to do with water. It just feels like it's such a healing journey for all of us. And I'm excited for that. I've always been a water baby, but I am excited for all of us healing our waters. I actually was just in Martha's Vineyard and they're, I think they're called the polar bears. I'm, I can't remember the exact name, but there was this huge group of black people in the water chanting. And I'm like, what is this? So I just started filming them. And um, that same day I saw this artwork of, of our, um, our ancestors who had jumped off of the, the ships just in, in water. So like these, these um, beautiful art pieces that were representing that. And I just felt like it was so healing for the waters, like to have all of these black people, beautiful black people chanting in the water in the Atlantic ocean where all of this happened. And I was like, oh yes, it's happening. We are reclaiming this. Some would say that the hurricanes that are very prevalent uh, take the path of the Middle Passage. And those are those souls, oh. you know. Oh, I just got chills, really. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think about it. And as I look, I have a map on my on my desk. So I'm looking at it, you know, that, that you know, every year we see that, you know. Yeah. Anyway, I, um, you know, Anita Kopach is here.